All right, hello everybody and welcome to our fifth snack and chat with Fastadel today. My name is Sarah Norris, coordinator in the Career Services Office. Um, today, John, our new in, um, internship coordinator and employer relations, he's going to be running everything. So without further ado, take it away, John. Awesome, thanks so much, Sarah. And uh, welcome again, everybody, to another uh, awesome snack and chat. Uh, we're pleased to have Mike Roush uh, coming all the way from South Carolina to uh, join us and talk to us about uh, Bastinel and uh, uh, career competencies. So Mike, thanks so much for being here. No problem, glad to be here. Thanks for the invite. Awesome, we're gonna start out with uh, some basic questions about uh, Fastenal and, uh, um, and Mike as well, and then uh, we'll transition into uh, conversation again about career competencies. So without further ado, Mike, um, tell us a little bit about uh, Fastenal and what you do and, um, and go from there. Sure. We are a industrial supply company. We are a distributor of a lot of commodities. So we started out over 50 years ago selling fasteners, hence the name Fastenal, uh, but we've uh, migrated into a lot of different product categories. So we are that one-stop shop for supplies to a lot of different industries. So uh, you think about uh, the, the companies that are in the news today with essential business. So whether it's uh, hospitals or uh, government agencies or you know, first responders to the actual manufacturing facilities of food processing plants or uh, power industries, um, universities. Uh, you think about all these different uh, companies or entities out there, we supply uh, the products to keep their employees safe. We'll talk about the, the PPE, which is in the news uh, very heavily right now. Uh, we sell a lot of those products in the safety field, but we also sell products that uh, keep um, products uh, running. So we uh, maintain you know, the maintenance type of products that will keep um, manufacturing going, as well as the end product, which is production. Um, so we, we, it's broken into three categories. Uh, MRO, which is maintenance, repair, and operations. That's the type of products that we're supplying. And then we also sell OEM parts, which is the original equipment manufacturer. That would be like a production part. So if we're selling to an automotive manufacturer, it could be actually the, the lug nuts that go on the wheels, or it could be assembly parts. So it goes in the final, final goods. And then we also sell some construction supplies as well. So that's just an overview, but we are a middleman, if you want to call it that. We we are uh, feet on the street. We have uh, local sales reps that go out and build relationships with customers in the field. So all those industries we talked about, uh, we are a, a B2B, which is business to business, and we thrive on customer service. And that's the reason we have a lot of store locations so that we can service our customers well. So we're, you think about the opposite of a, an Amazon or dropship type company, uh, a big box house or even a Lowe's or Home Depot, we sell a lot of the same products, but uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, a lot different strategy of how we go to business, and that's that face-to-face -face customer service. Very cool, very cool. Has uh, has the company been uh, uh, negatively impacted by the current situation? A little bit of a tangent. Yeah, it's a great question. So yes and no. Uh, overall, we just actually released our uh, uh, numbers for April, and uh, as a company, we grew seven percent over last year and you and that's a shocking number right you would think sure, wow sure. uh we are uh, we're a large organization we're a five billion dollar company and we have over three thousand servicing locations so you think about the impact that, that we would have across you know you see so many things shut down but that seven percent growth tells you that there was a lot of spike um business opportunities for us as a, a distributor and, and keeping the supply chain going once again you think about the um the word of the day, right? You hear supply chain, you hear PPE, you hear uh, unprecedented times, all those key words that you hear every every night in the news. Uh, but we're, we're quite busy in certain pockets of the of the country because of the, the need. So we're servicing, we're still out there working hard in the field to uh, supply those products. And there is a lot of challenges in that because of the supply and demand of those hot commodities that are out there. So we're doing a, a really a good job of trying to work with our manufacturers and vendors uh, to get those, uh, those uh, essential items to our critical needs customers. And so although a lot of our manufacturing plants are closed uh, and they're just now phasing in a ramp up stage, uh, so the non-essential business, you know, it's, it's zero, right? Because they're closed. Mm -hmm. But uh, for us to still grow 7% as a company tells you that, you know, we have a lot of hot spots across the area that we are super busy. And um, so it's an interesting time for sure. 
um, as we ramp up going forward, uh, no one knows, you know, what even tomorrow looks like, but sure. uh, we were actually kind of uh, uh, surprised uh, of our positive growth. And even two weeks ago, uh, in one of our investor calls, uh, we had anticipated negative growth, uh, but it just shows you the, just the volatile time and, and the, how quickly that supply and demand can, can change your outlook. Very cool. Well, that's, that's great news for you. And hopefully uh, it's a, a precursor to good news for the rest of us as well. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about you and your role with, uh, with the company. Sure. So this is my 25th year of the company, actually. So next year, June, I mean, next month, uh, June 16th will be my 25th year anniversary. And I started out uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I was a uh, manager trainee, and I did uh, a lot of sales-related customer service, uh, helping manage the bottom line of a, a local store. I did that for a couple years and then became an assistant manager of a, a local store in Morristown, Tennessee. And I did that. Um, I had an opportunity to come run a store. That's how I moved to Anderson, South Carolina. I had the opportunity to become a general manager. I did that in 1999 and did that for about three, three and a half years. I then had the opportunity to uh, become a district sales manager. And I did that in the state of South Carolina. So in 2002 until 2016, I spent the vast majority of my, my fastenal career in that role. And that role was uh, very rewarding in the fact that you helped uh, obviously manage relationships with your customers, but more, uh, I guess, rewarding was the uh, development of our employees and, and helping coach and mentor them and, and really uh, use that team camaraderie to, to build that business. So everything from uh, key account management to uh, manage employees and, and their training and, and, and uh, empowering them to do well in their roles. And, uh, and that kind of uh, leads me into my next position. So my current role, I'm the director of recruiting. I've been doing that for five years now. And uh, in this role, my main responsibility is to help support our hiring managers in the field uh, to develop good pipelines for recruiting, just like this call today, is how do we um, maximize our uh, relationships so that we can uh, bring value to uh, professors, career services, professional development, as well as the students. and and bring a real life perspective from an employer's point of view to the students. And then inherently we will brand ourselves and we have an opportunity to engage with them and, and encourage them to apply for a position then, and hire the students while they're still in school. You know, we are a, a promote from within company. And so we like a lot of a part-time engagement. And then when they graduate, we want to find a full-time opportunity for them. So we heavily um, promote from within. So that means that we need to have that pipeline full from a lot of different uh, level so sophomores, juniors, seniors, so that when we uh, when we grow, and we'll talk a little bit growth a little bit later, but um, we're always going to need great people, and we need folks that uh, have a, a passion for customer service and are willing to roll their sleeves up and uh, and get it done. That's awesome. Um, what was your degree in, and why did you ultimately choose a, a company like Fastenal to start your career? Yep, I was a business management major. I went to Carson Newman college and it's now a university, but um, uh, I also had an emphasis in human resources and marketing. So I'm one of those unique individuals that actually uh, have used my degree in every role I've had within the company. Um, I did not know coming out of college, uh, I didn't know what Fastenal was, I didn't know uh, anything about the company, but I was recruited by a district manager uh, that, that came to a career fair at Carson Newman. And uh, that person today actually is our regional vice president in the Southeast region. And uh, I just had a conversation with him uh, yesterday. So uh, part of my role is helping support the regional vice presidents also in that recruiting effort. Uh, but it's kind of ironic that he was the one that hired me 25 years ago. And, and now uh, we work together in, in helping develop um, recruiting pipelines within his region. Um, but so that those degrees um, are helpful in everything that, that I've done. Um, but we also, I will say this too, uh, we have a lot of folks that have been successful that, that aren't in a direct field. So, for example, uh, his, historically, uh, business majors is, is where we spend most of our time and, and we get a lot of good folks in those departments. But it also doesn't preclude you from uh, being a good employee. If maybe if you're a communication major or psychology major, there's other fields. Obviously, we have a lot of uh, successful leaders in our company that have a background or an education is, is non-related. Uh, ultimately, we'll talk a little bit about this too in the, later in the call, we're looking for characteristics and qualities 
uh, that match our company culture. And so it doesn't always um, you know, fall in line with a, with a business degree um, more times than not it does, but uh, we're really more concerned about the uh, characteristics and making sure that there's a good fit uh, with the, uh, the personality as well as the skill sets. And, and we'll talk you know, about the career readiness and those attributes or um, soft skills, transferable skills, whatever you want to call them, those things are very important. And ultimately that's what uh, we're looking for at the end of the day. That's awesome. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, offer a congratulations, 25 years, that, uh, that's a pretty good milestone. So congratulations. Thank you. You're welcome. So we sort of touched on uh, you know, your current projects as a recruiter. Um, what past experiences, whether it was uh, in college, uh, work experience as a teenager or a volunteer, that really helped prepare you the most for your career, you know, the 25 years you've been going? Yeah, I would say uh, pretty easily the answer to that is just uh, work ethic. Um, I was uh, fortunate to grow up in a family that, that worked hard, and, and I saw that. Um, you know, I, I mentioned rolling your sleeves up earlier, but that's really uh, that's at the core of who we are as a company. And one of those cultural values that we embrace and we look for in interviews is ambition. And uh, I can't say uh, enough about the importance of that because that drive, that internal makeup, work ethic, all those things are critical in uh, success of, of folks on the Fastenal team because uh, the, the pro of, of Fastenal is that we, uh, we empower employees and we give a lot of ownership, a sense of um, autonomy uh, to make a lot of good decisions. Uh, but if you give that um, to someone who doesn't have driver ambition, uh, it's not going to be a successful plan. So um, on one side, it, most of our employees love not being micromanaged. I touched upon about uh, mentoring and coaching as employees. Um, but if you, uh, if you give that freedom and that uh, luxury of being able to run your own business, but you have somebody that's not am ambitious, uh, it's not a good mix. So um, for me, I think uh, just growing up and, and working early, uh, you know, well before, uh, you know, being able to drive a car, just, you know, 12, 13, cutting grass and, and doing things and helping around, um, you know, just seeing that work ethic and just working hard and knowing that in a customer service sales industry, you are rewarded for your efforts. And so it's, it's, and it's not about always about the financial, it's about a sense of ownership and pride and all that falls into that category of uh, work ethic and, and ambition and drive. So I would say just the work history uh, and, and always um, enjoying uh, the reward from a, a, a job well done. Very cool, very cool. Um, I guess we'll do this as a, a two-part question, but prior to the current pandemic, what was, what's the biggest challenge your department faces? You know, and then obviously now, what's the you know, current situation we're in? What's the, you know, the biggest challenge that your department faces? Sure. So I would say the biggest challenge will be just implementing best practices across the country. So we have, as a director, uh, as I touched earlier, one of my main responsibilities is to support the hiring managers in the field. We have over 200 hiring managers. So the district managers, that the same role I had for 13 years. So I know it well. You know, they're responsible for the hiring in their local market. So every district manager may have you know, 15, 20 store locations, and they're responsible for all the hiring and all the employee development of their locations. So there are certain um, basic principles or best practices that uh, we, we put out there for recruiting pipelines, but every area is, is different. Uh, every market, geographic area, there may not be higher ed locations within certain geographic locations. There may be other recruiting pipelines that they have to tap into and be creative. So it's, it's not just recruiting at colleges, universities, but recruiting uh, in the field with maybe uh, looking at high school programs or maybe looking at you know, chamber of commerce, looking at uh, business groups, professional organizations, um, community groups where there's uh, common interest maybe within uh, supply chain folks or um, you know, thinking outside of the box, maybe partnering with uh, clubs. So maybe uh, DECA, for example, or FFA or um, uh, you know, future B FBLA, Future Business Leaders of America, those national programs at high schools. And, and we can't hire someone unless they're 18, but if we get them at that uh, second semester senior, that, that could be a pipeline to tap into. So being creative, looking for ways to uh, encourage our employees to uh, provide referrals. Uh, we, I'm a firm believer in understanding that uh, an existing employee can be 
a huge asset in the recruiting process because they know somebody. Uh, they're they're rubbing shoulders every day with people we want to hire because they they typically hang out with folks like themselves. So if we have a great employee, uh, a perfect example is if you have someone who's um, goes to the YMCA and plays pickup basketball every weekend, and you know they're sitting on the bench waiting for, waiting to play, or they can strike up a conversation and talk with somebody that might look for a great opportunity. So it's word of mouth spreading that we have 22,000 employees. So there's power in numbers. If we have everybody on board with the recruiting mindset and have that recruiting hat on, then we can get great referrals. And so we, it's a complement of all those things together, but ultimately it's branding our company and showcasing the opportunities are there. And then ultimately finding the right fit because that's the most important piece in long-term retention is that both parties are, are happy. So, you know, the employee is engaged and they love coming to work. And they tell others about it. And then also Fastall is benefited by the results that they bring because they are, uh, they're engaged, they're all in, they understand the value in that. So the challenge is that is to get um, everybody on board the same page. We may go to a certain pocket of, of uh, geographic area that um, everybody's not on board with the enthusiasm of recruiting, or maybe they're just scratching the surface and not digging in deep and not doing justice. In other words, Maybe they're just going to a spring and fall career fair. That's all they do. That's they think that's their their recruiting um, uh, strategy or plan. That's not a plan. That's just kind of throwing darts at a dartboard and cross your fingers and hope somebody comes to the table. A better strategy is to build a relationship with uh, recruiting partners and schools and and whatever um, area that we're we're touching on that population. But to build a rapport so we can educate what we're looking for and to provide that opportunity. That's awesome. We're going to skip down a couple of questions here. Uh, I saw a question pop up, so we'll take a break halfway through and we'll get that question in there from Lilia. But um, what's the biggest reward of your job? So let me go back to um, my previous position. Uh, biggest reward I had as a district sales manager was seeing uh, employees succeed, you know, watching watching them uh, get promotions, watching them uh, land a sale or, or build a relationship or seeing them be rewarded for their, um, for their efforts. And so as a, as a leader, a coach or mentor, and I've said that word several times already, but it, it's really in our DNA is how we help others succeed. And that's what management is, is getting the most out of people and doing it in a way that's uh, enjoyable. So uh, it's, it's not driving numbers out of people. It's not uh, treating everyone the same. It's treating everyone equally, but also uh, understanding what, what drives people. Uh, what is it that makes them tick and what gets them uh, excited to, to, to do well in their role. So uh, just watching others succeed and uh, especially being around 25 years, you see a lot of those stories. And then when, when we have uh, annual meetings together as a company and seeing folks you hadn't seen in three, four, five, ten years even, um, it, it's great to kind of catch up and, and just to see how they're still thriving and, uh, and excited about their careers. That's awesome. And, you know, one of the things that struck me with you, you spoke about earlier is, you know, how well the company does customer service that comes from the top down, you know, so Absolutely. you can see that just in your 10 minute conversation here that from the top down, if your company breeds that, of course, the employees on the front end are going to breed that as far as customer service with the public. So that's a, a great motto to, you know, to have and to live by. So that's, that's very good. Um, so on the other, on the flip side, what's uh, maybe a downside of the position or you know, a tough part of your position? Yeah, so my current position, the hardest part is, is I can't be everywhere. And so how do you uh, spread the, uh, the success stories uh, across the country in a way that everybody can embrace it and see it as a good opportunity and use it as a, an, um, an example of what they could do, maybe change some things to maybe create some positive results. Um, I, I try to uh, do the uh, the one-on-one -on -one approach, and, and so if we have a new hiring manager, for example, uh, that is promoted to a position, I'll go spend a couple of days with them um, and and just kind of show them the ropes and then talk out loud about what are their needs are, what do they know of their current recruiting uh, sources in their areas. If they have a good lead, let's let's uh, expand upon it, or if, if we need to create new ones, let's go in there and find out how we can do it and use past experiences of just examples of how we engage there. And, and um, usually the, the new hiring managers, they're uh, very excited and they're wanting to jump in and, and really do a, a great job at it. And they understand that the, the personnel piece is what drives everything else we do. Uh, I mentioned we wear a lot of hats, but ultimately 
company can be great, but if you don't have people that are on board or in, in, uh, in alignment with your values and have the aptitude and passion, uh, it's all going to fall flat. So uh, that is the critical piece uh, of a good, um, a good business unit. I got uh, two questions left. Um, you know, for the next 10 years, do you foresee the, the company changing, the, your job changing, or even any of the jobs on the front line changing? Um, I know there's a lot of talk now with the pandemic and things like that, that there is the, in the foreseeable future, you know, of positions changing based on, you know, the current situation, more virtual, maybe less customer service, who knows? Mm -hmm. Do you uh, foresee that changing within the next 10 years? Certainly, there's going to be some aspects of change and talk about change. We're in that unprecedented time. And if I've heard unprecedented or uncharted waters, <laughs> uh, you know, once I've heard it 80 times in the last week. Right. Um, so we are certainly uh, anticipating some change and how we can uh, use this. Think about it from a, a positive standpoint. What what can we take away when we get out of this and we phase back into full speed ahead? What? we sit back and say, we can still do this. What we learned in that innovation or that adaptability time, how can we use that to be more efficient uh, and effective in our roles? So I certainly think there'll be pieces of that, uh, especially in the recruiting aspect. But certainly I think we can do more of these type of activities, uh, just maybe if it's initial engagement. So from my perspective, maybe we do more of these intros with our local hiring managers, whereas before I would travel and like a new, new district manager, as I mentioned before, when I go, and do that, we do a face-to-face, -face, and I do believe face-to-face -face is better, but this is still can be an effective tool, and it can be more efficient uh, to touch more people and have more conversations. So I think that would be one thing I take away, absolutely, would be uh, to have more contact virtually in a, in a productive way. Um, now, from our, our uh, base business, customer service is not going away. Uh, we are not, um, certainly we have online sales, and we have uh, technology to use uh, that will help and um, people um, ordering products from us, but uh, the every day, us seeing customers, building relationships and solving problems, that's what we do. That's the reason we have 3,000 plus servicing locations is so we can be in rural markets close to our manufacturing facilities, close to the customer, and we provide inventory management of items. So I talked about those PPE products. We have a, a vending program that we put in place over 10 years ago that has grown exponentially and uh, ironically it's mostly safety products in those machines so those machines at a xyz manufacturing facility we fill the machines and we analyze the reports so that customer service is not going away it's only going to get great it's only going to grow uh, so that that's been a very uh, positive impact to, uh, to our company as a growth driver so we're going to continue to do that we have over 100,000 vending machines in the field today that we're servicing. And uh, what happens is the customer sees the benefits of it, the accountability, the cleanliness, the organization of it, and they wanna add more products to it. And they wanna put more of them at their facility and grow it. So that's gonna continue, which requires customer service. Uh, so that the next 10 years, the other item I would say would be opening more uh, what we call on sites. So instead of a, a brick and mortar uh, sales office that we're um, servicing out of a, a location, we we'll actually go to the customer itself and have fast on employees uh, on on site, and then we would help serve the customer directly. So that'll be over the next ten years where we we invest more time and energy as far as our labor resources because ultimately we're kind of capped out from a market standpoint of opening up physical locations. We don't want to put a another store in a uh, five thousand populated town when we have one ten minutes away that can service it just as just as well. So. Uh, we are shifting from a um, how we open up our branches versus on site. So those are the kind of the two things I would take away from the next 10 years. Very cool. And uh, last question, what's the best piece of advice that uh, somebody, career advice that somebody's given you as you, you know, started your long career at uh, Fastenal or even before? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, I would have to say probably uh, don't be afraid to make a mistake. And, and then show that ambition and drive by just jumping in and doing things. Don't wait for somebody to give you a list to do something. Don't wait for a supervisor to um, say, here, I need these three things done. And then once you're done, you don't do anything else, right? So pick up a broom, pick up, pick up something. Do, you, know, you can be intuitive of thinking of how to, how to be pro, proactive in the next step, even though someone didn't tell you that next step. And so that, that goes back to the entrepreneur feel that uh, I have and is what a lot of our employees have because we want 
to uh, serve our customers well. We want to treat um, the company we work for like we are, like we're our owners. And and uh, you you touched on it earlier, and you're dead on. Uh, the foundation of our company is to empower our people and our founder uh, and leaders uh, following him have continued to um, really hone in on that entrepreneur feel. And if you were to ask any of our employees, I think they would probably it'd be the one or top one or two things they would say they like about the company is that sense of ownership that uh, we really do empower. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, just a side note, uh, I coached baseball uh, uh, 12U and we were lucky enough to have a Zoom last night with a professional ball player. And uh, one of the questions was, you know, a, a famous quote or something, a motto he lives by. And, you know, the correlation to work and sports, you know, can be made. And mm -hmm. his, you know, motto that he lives by is when somebody walks in the room and asks the question, who's the hardest worker? Yeah, you would hope that everybody turns their head and looks at you, you know, yeah. as you're the hardest worker and, and you hit the nail right on the head, pick up a broom, do something, ask a question, what can I do now? Even if it's outside your scope of, uh, you know, what your job role is, you know, you want to be uh, helpful to that company. So awesome advice. Um, I appreciate that first half of the uh, conversation. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. She's going to moderate some of the questions that came through chat and then she'll make the transition into uh, uh, career competency. So thanks a lot, Mike. Okay. Thank you. All right, first I'm just gonna see Lilia or Jeff, do either of you wanna ask the question or do you want me to go ahead and ask it for you? Um, I'll ask it. Um, well, hello, thank you for coming, Mike. Um, yep. Yeah, I was wondering, cause you mentioned you worked your way up through the business. So like what, um, like how do you think working those positions helped you develop soft skills, hard skills, or you know, your hard work ethic? that helps you in the position you are now just because you know i feel like you learn a lot more and are able to use it from that uh higher position by working through the positions than if you just kind of stay in that higher role yep absolutely uh experience is, is a great uh, educator and uh, so uh when you when you have a business acumen for example um in, in college and you work hard and a lot of those things, so we don't just look at a GPA, um, mm -hmm. we look at that education experience because you learn time management, you learn how to balance things, you learn how to prepare for tests, you learn how to work in, in groups for teamwork, for projects. All those things are, are life skills that you learn. And then when you mm -hmm. get into the real world, you just apply those things. And mm -hmm. so uh, the experience that you have on a day-to-day -day basis, and that goes back to that um, entrepreneur feel, uh, not afraid to make mistakes. The company mm -hmm. gives you a lot of power to go out and um, it's not like you have to wait a year before you start seeing customers or getting in the field and, and uh, rolling your sleeves up and doing the job. So when you do that, you're going to make mistakes, uh, but what, what you learn from. And so when you apply what you've learned in textbook to meet real world, um, you learn a lot of things and then you learn next time you go do something differently. Uh, so all those soft skills, uh, maybe how to interact or communicate differently in a situation when you learn from it. All those are things you just bank in your memory and you move forward. So I think just the experience that you have hands on really can uh, drive home um, you know, a, a, a better future for your soft skills. Yeah, thank you. I agree. You know, I think that's one of the hardest things is transferring what you've learned. You know, it's a scary thing, I guess, into your work, you know, and actually trying to apply it. Yeah. Good All question. right, thank you. Ooh, thank you, Lilia. All right, and our next question is from Jeff. He wanted to know, um, does Fast at All offer internships and have they been paused for the summer and or fall? Yes and yes. Uh, don't know what the fall looks like at this moment, uh, but we do offer internships. We have a, a sales and operations internship and we also have supply chain focus as well. Um, for us, an internship is is a three-month program that, um, that the training that you would uh, go through would be very similar to a, a standard employee. In fact, it, it's a paid internship, so they would apply online, and uh, the, the process is the same exact for any, any other employment process. So they have to go to our careers page and click on the link and upload the resume, and then we'd uh, go through the interview process. Uh, but in the summer, we are not doing any at this time. Uh, going into fall, I, I'm hopeful we'll pick back up. And um, the one thing I will say on the internships, it's it's a little different than uh, maybe some companies that we we really do, as I said, promote from within. So we want to retain that employee uh, going forward. So once that internship is over, uh, we want to keep them on on the books and keep them learning, um, 
the real world experience. So if it's a sophomore uh, and you, uh, and it doesn't have to be summer either. It can be any time throughout. We, we hire year round. We don't have cyclical uh, hiring cycles uh, to our company because we're, we're always in need of great folks. And so that internship can start at any moment and uh, we will assign a mentor and then you'll, we'll have some training checkpoints, but a lot of it is a hands-on as the job shadowing experience. Um, so it's almost more of a co-op than it is a, an internship because we want to vet that candidate uh, to understand what is their true motive for applying for the internship and not just uh, uh, get experience and build a resume. Although that will be, you know, you'll get it and get build your resume, but we want to uh, have a, a long-term impact on that process. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mike. That is all of our questions for now. So I'll let John take it from here. You're muted, John. Sorry, yeah. I know. I'm on mute. I forget to hit that darn button. Um, so, um, Mike, do you, do you need us uh, to, to, you're going to share your screen or um, yep. are you just going to speak? Awesome. So if you want to share your screen, we're going to talk about uh, uh, career readiness competencies. And that's a huge topic as, uh, you know, current students or graduates, uh, you know, heading into a field, what really is a company looking for? So uh, sure. I'll turn it over to you. All right. Sounds good. All right, well, as I pull this up here, let me get prepared to share my PowerPoint. I just got a few slides I want to touch base on, and uh, it's really revolved around some of the things we've already talked about. Uh, it's about the, uh, can you guys see my screen now? All right, good, got a thumbs up from John there, he's on mute. All right, so let me uh, jump right into uh, so just a little bit of comic relief. And it's kind of funny, John, that you had had yourself on mute a minute ago, because if you look at this little uh, conference called Bingo here, it's funny. I like to ask the question, uh, who has heard these comments over even just the last week, right? Um, I think we can all say that we probably could fill this whole card up in one call, pretty much. So uh, it, I, I will ask a question. If anybody's got any funny stories, uh, take yourself off mute. I like to ask the question because obviously you're in the distance learning and you're two months in. And so I'm sure you've had some experiences uh, that were comical in regards to uh, a, a WebEx or Zoom or Teams meeting call. Anybody have any uh, stories they'd like to share that were somewhat funny? I think my favorite one thus far is we had our big staff meeting with all of our staff workers and everything or student workers yesterday and our one student had a space background so at the end of the meeting he's like well I gotta fly home now so it was pretty entertaining that he had a nice space background it shook things up a little bit yeah <laughs> so for me this is can't believe this even happened. So um, we were in class and he set up his Zoom on his computer, but also had it on his phone too. And he forgot to mute his computer, but he had his screen off and you could hear him fighting with his girlfriend in the back in the middle of our class while everybody's doing class presentations. So it's quite interesting. Definitely recommend just muting your microphone at all times. <laughs> Yep, it, it makes you a little paranoid, right? Because there's so many pieces of technology now that with, with your phone. Is that app still open or is this closed or is that mute button on and you got two devices? And so you're right. Yeah. There's a lot more uh, opportunities for some mistakes there. <laughs> Very good. Uh, well, I will go ahead and jump into the competencies that, that we touched on. Um, the one I want to talk today about um, and hone into is adaptability. And the reason I want to talk about that is uh, we are currently in a, uh, in a time of our, our country that is uh, very unique. I, I said uncharted waters and un um, unprecedented times, and it, it truly is. So uh, there's, not a, um, there's not a textbook that tells us how to take the next step. And in fact, you, if you're honest, you, you probably don't know. One, one day you may figure out, here's what I'm doing, and next day you change your mind, because how do you filter the the information that's coming out of how to, you know, think about campuses getting back on in person in the fall. Uh, the timing of that, is it safe? When do we do it? All those things. And you have to make personal decisions. Uh, and, and so, and things change day by day. So you have to adapt and you have to be willing to uh, do your research, but also uh, make decisions that, um, that quite honestly, we don't always know what the right decision to make is. So 
in regards to especially folks that are maybe seniors, right? Uh, you're in, in a, a point where you're getting ready to get in the workforce that's, um, that's, that's not the best environment in, in regards to um, unemployment. Uh, even if you think back, back in December, you know, we had the, um, you know, it's a great um, job market and, and opportunities for, for quality students when you're, when you're graduating to, to find a, a job in a market that, that fits them. And now there's going to be a lot of jobs that, that aren't available at this, at this point in time. So how do you adapt? Um, so I want to touch base on that specifically. If you look at the screen, you've got, we got nine core competencies that uh, we look at as our employees uh, or even potential employees. Do you have uh, an aptitude uh, to excel in any of these categories? So what is a career competency? Uh, it's, we touched on it earlier. It's, it's a soft skill. It's a transferable skill. It's just, they're all the same thing. It's just rebranded in the, the career competency. I think uh, NACE standards, which is a, a national association of college and employers. It's a consortium group that a lot of career services, professional development, um, a community group that work together at a national level uh, with employers. And they talk a lot about best practices and how they can hone in and support their students and build those relationships, but they have the standards that are very similar to what we have listed in our career readiness. But ultimately, we look for these skills uh, as, um, as characteristics of, of future hires. Uh, I want to touch on adaptability, but there's also three others that kind of tie right into our current environment. I've talked about work ethic and how important that is, and, um, and I really believe that that ambition and drive come from past experiences and people you model in the, in the, in the past. But part of that adaptability is also being uh, self-reliant and how you, how do you motivate yourself when you are in a uncontrolled manner? In other words, everybody is remotely um, learning. Everybody is uh, working from home. Everybody is in situations where they're not supervised. They're not in an office setting. They're not in a traditional, um environment so you have to rely on yourself you have to figure out ways to not sleep in and not hit the snooze button and not uh you're not getting up and you're are you in you know your your pjs all day right you know you're in a different stage of um stage of life that is just very unique so there is a there is a tendency potentially um to not be as productive and so I'm not just talking about students. Uh, I'm talking about the people that work at home. Um, are they taking more breaks than they would if they were in the office setting? Are they uh, doing things? Are they respectful of their time as an employer? Uh, are they embodying integrity of working from home and not um, not uh, fudging on the, the work time? So all these things uh, are very applicable to today. You even think about all the you know, K through 12 kids uh, going to distance learning and and now that the parents are home having to help teach their students or their kids, they are now students and uh, that, that's a challenge. So how do you make that an effective method? Um, and so that goes back to adapting and, and just evolving to how to adjust that environment. And then, and then lastly, problem solving skills is it's just how do you um, how do you make it work? It's not, uh, we are quote unquote on a pause in the country, in our business and in our restaurants and, and all these uh, industries that, that are just closed down right now. The, that pause though, um, there's still ways that you can figure out ways to, to make a buck. There's still ways that how do I serve my customer in whatever industry you're in and you have to use problem solving skills and you have to be innovative in, in how you go about doing it. So with the, and here's just a little screenshot of our, our four cultural values, and I touched upon that ambition earlier, but integrity, innovation, and teamwork, those are the four core values that we look at uh, and look for in the potential hires uh, within our interview process. So adaptability, how do you change with time? So I, I touched on that vending machine um, growth driver for us earlier. So that's just an example what they look like you know they dispense products so it could be anything it, it's completely customizable and um it's it's uh we create a planogram the customer tells us what they want in stock 
It could be spray paint, like you see in the back there, or duct tape, um, safety glasses, earplugs, safety masks, you name it. And those, those parts can be um, distributed through a vending machine where you have a, a slide a card and that, that badge then is accountability so they know who got what when. And it's in a, a very uh, clean uh, inventory management type program that um, 10 year, 10 plus years ago, if we didn't adapt and, and, and utilize technology, then who knows where our, our sales in that commodity would be. So for example, and I don't know the exact, I'm not quoting exact numbers, but we have single digit growth. So think about our, uh, as a company, I touched on earlier, Fastenal, Fasteners was the largest commodity that we sold. When I started 25 years ago, it was 90, 95% Fasteners. And that five ten percent was tools, just a uh, you know a, a commodity that was kind of complementary. But then twenty fast forward twenty five years, well fast forward fifteen years. So our safety supplies commodity, that group of products that we sell, was probably you know four or five percent single digits. Um, and now we are pushing you know almost a fourth of our business is safety. You think about almost we're a five billion dollar company, over a billion dollars is safety products going through that machine. And uh, that technology or adapting to another way of providing service to a customer created a growth. So I think about what if we didn't do that? Where would we be if we didn't adapt and innovate? And so what is the definition of adaptability? And you know, it's new conditions, right? And, and uh, what, I can't think of another time where new conditions is relative, right? In the COVID-19 environment, that's what every day is, is new conditions. And then how do you modify to that environment? So I look at it, you got two options. You can either adapt or you can sit back, put your hands on and sit on your hands and wait for um, the governors to tell us, go back to work. And okay, now we go back to work. But what did you do? Did you waste two months? Did you waste three months? Did you sit and do nothing or just watch Netflix all day? And, or did you think about ways to innovate and adapt yourself and, and make the best of it? I think, um, you know, back to ambition and drive. When I talk to employees, you know, I don't want I don't want an employee to tell me why they can't do something. I want them to show me why they can. Right? You know, that goes back to don't be scared to make a mistake. It's critical um, that that you you don't make excuses or blame. And and trust me, there's a lot of people that can make legitimate excuses at this time, but there's still plenty of people that can say, you know, I I went out there and I hustled and figured out a way to make it. I, I did this and then and we created new opportunities. So uh, you have to have to move forward. Uh, I'll, I'll give one example of a company that didn't adapt, right? Um, probably most of the students on this call, they never stepped foot in one of these places, but you probably heard the story, right? You know, there used to be these um, blue buildings where you'd go and rent a movie and you'd get a physical disc or tape and put it in the, in your player at home and you'd watch a movie. Well, now obviously we are, in the streaming world. Um, but the example is that Blockbuster did not innovate and adapt to the future of technology. Uh, and what they did, they, and they, they had a thriving business. You know, they didn't, they relied on their past success and felt like, okay, this is good. And they kind of rested on their laurels and kept doubling down on what they had that worked in the past. And they didn't think, or they didn't uh, move forward with the, the adaption. And now we see that they're bankrupt and they're no longer in existence and the streaming industry is, is thriving. Same thing with Fastenal. If we did not adapt to that vending technology uh, in one part of our inventory management um, portfolio, then who knows where we, we I, I guarantee you we wouldn't have the percentage of safety sales that we have today. So just one example that, that you probably can relate to that uh, touches bases on the adaptability side. And, and at the end of the day, you know, really, when you're forced into an environment like we are, that necessity creates innovation. Uh, there's going to be tons of businesses that are created uh, and moving forward that'll be in existence from for a long time because of of what's transpired. Because people think differently now, right? You think about ways that that man, I didn't think about that before, but man, that's that's probably not the uh, the safest thing to do, or this is a better way to prevent uh, infection, or this is. It, there's ways that we can uh, be more efficient. What, you know, why is it that we always had to face have a face to face, but now we can do use technology for a a Zoom call that can get in contact. So not just having a meeting to have a meeting that is not the most productive from a uh, travel standpoint. You can save money 
in certain cases. Now, there's still going to be times where you have to meet in person and it's, it's more effective. But I think we're going to ask a question. Can I do this virtually or can I, do I need to do this in person? That's going to be the question we're going forward. And there's going to be more times. I think somebody said on the call earlier that there's going to be a pocket of the university that's going to stay online. And there's going to be a segment that uh, attracts certain students to that environment. So that can be a uh, selling point from, the, from a higher ed that, that there's an option right there. Uh, and once we figured out that we can do it, we were forced to uh, get in that position. But now you can fine tune it, make it more effective. And so I think that that makes sense. So same thing from the recruiting standpoint. There's going to be things that I take away from what have we learned? How can we do this? And I've touched upon that example earlier. But uh, it's really about what you do with it. So it's not about uh, you know what happens. It's like what is your reaction? What's your response? That is is really the testament of understanding what impact any circumstance had it is your reaction, your response to the circumstance. I think about, I'll give you a little example of, um, I have two young uh, girls at home and you know, when they get into um, you know, conflict or they're arguing back and forth, you know, the other one always wants to be right. The other one wants to have the upper edge and they want to have the, the last word. But ultimately, if, if you, you can, you, the only thing you can control is your response. You can't control what somebody does to you. You can't control the environment. You can't control the COVID-19 that, that we're in, but you can re, you can't control your reaction, how you move forward. So are you sitting on your hands or are you finding creative ways to, to, to do something, to be better? And so my, my challenge is just to, to look at the glass half full, figure out ways you can respond and not focus on the things that you can't control, but focus on the things that uh, you can impact. And then when when the opportunity arises, you can take advantage of that because you prepared yourself. And then last thing I'll talk about is just a little bit of a, how do you, how do you handle it? So here's just some quick tips, but um, you know, don't, um, don't sit on your hands. <laughs> I've said that several times, but you know, do more with, with what you have, find out the ways that you can be efficient, uh, you know, and just rise to the challenge. Make sure you uh, look at ways to, um, not get flustered you know so it says find calm in the chaos the chaos is everywhere um and if you if you watch the news too long you'll get discouraged and you'll get you'll get down so figure out a, a balance figure out ways to be educated but don't dwell on it to the point where you can't you become paralyzed if you become paralyzed then nobody's effective <clears throat> you can't do anything you, you freeze that's what paralyzed is and and you if you want to bounce back and be prepared um if you're doing nothing, your your bounce back time ratio is going to be way out of whack, and it'll be next year before you actually can function. Uh, so you got to figure out, and it's personal. You got to figure out how you're going to stage your your back, you know, process back into face to face, and and it's a personal decision, obviously. And so I would also encourage you not to look down upon somebody that's that's still more cautious, or 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 the other way, if somebody's full speed ahead, and um, you know. It is a personal decision, but you be smart about how you how it affects others, and and make decisions that um, are prudent to uh, being effective for you. And, and then lastly, um, it's a time to reevaluate processes. So your priorities. I think you, we probably all kind of thought back. Well, I have more time on my hands. I'm thinking through this and not just kind of going through motions. But why do I do this? Ask ask the why. What is your why? Uh, and a lot of things are your just daily schedule. You know, you think about why do I spend this much time doing this, or why why is um, why is this irritating me, or why am I not bothered by this? So it's it's almost a reflection time that you can take and reevaluate your priorities. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a overview on maybe ways you can uh, adapt <laughs> to the environment. And then as I close, it's it's really about that resiliency. How do you bounce back? What kind of resolve? And it ultimately, it's just how quickly you can recover from the chaos. Uh, I touched earlier about the um, you know, how you respond and you have control of that response, but it's also about how quick you can do it. And don't wait. Uh, don't just push the pause button and wait for it to get over or close your eyes or stick your head in the sand and wait for it to be over. Is be, be effective in, in your current moment. Um, there's an old uh, saying, carpe diem, you seize the day. And, and do that now, even when it's a time where everybody's going to stir crazy, you're, you're locked in your, your rooms and, and you want to get out and do things, um, but be smart about it and, and just seize the day.
So with that, I, I pretty much close in regards to uh, the um, career readiness of adaptability. Uh, I've got a couple slides. I'm just going to kind of fly through to give you a little bit of insight on our company and some uh, call to action on how you can engage with us or get get in contact. And then I'll open it up for Q and A on any of the um, the things I said here as we wrap it up. Uh, and I'll send this PowerPoint out uh, to you, uh, John or Sarah, if you want to share, so you'll have uh, some of the um, ways to engage with us. But certainly, I encourage you to reach out to us on our Facebook page, the Fast All Company Careers and also with LinkedIn and you can connect with me on LinkedIn uh, and, and also with our Instagram page. But um, the one thing you can do is go to our website, our career page at uh, careers.fastnall.com and you can sign up for our Blue Team Career Network. What that'll do is get you connected with our, um, our, our newsletters. You also get information on job locations that could come up in your area. So you can type a zip code in, put your email, and we'll ping you for those opportunities that come open. And there's our, our Facebook page, our career page on Facebook. The internship uh, you asked earlier, there is a, a blurb there on that. And then our locations, I've touched on over 3,000 servicing location. Each one of those dots is a, is a local branch. And we, I also put this on here, all those locations that you see the blue dots on, those are the ones that are close in your, your vicinity. So you can see we have a lot of locations. So you could start while you're in school and, and have a, a close commute to your campus. And then when you graduate, you can transfer to another location. Maybe you're from another city, another state. We can help facilitate that. Or you can work straight there in your backyard if you like where you're at in the local community. Uh, I've put Jason, Jared Orr, he's our local district manager. He's one of the 200 that I mentioned that uh, is responsible for the hiring. So those dots are uh, his area that he would uh, be responsible for for the hiring. And we're also a global company. So we have 2,525 countries we are in. You can see uh, on the map there some of those locations. And uh, that's an overview. I've touched upon the 22,000 employees, uh, our uh, vending machine count, uh, our sales, $5 billion in sales. And, and I did not touch on this. We have our own distribution model. So we have our own DCs that um, we pull our products from. So we're not relying on UPS or FedEx uh, to service that supply chain is that we, we own our fleet and, and we are able to use that to, to get product delivered in a timely manner to our store locations. And we do that um, and be able to service our customers very well. And due to time, I'm not gonna play this, but I'll have the link in our um, the follow-up. It, it's a company culture video. So it's about a three minute video that'll give you some insight into what it looks like to work for us from different perspectives of different folks in the company. And with that, that's all I have. Any any questions from the group? All right, I did get one more from a student. It kind of came in after our middle section of questions, so I'm going to just yeah. read that one out. Um, as someone who's involved in industrial organizational psychology, um, worker well-being is always a focus. Does your company employ any IO psychologists? And if not, what are the methods the company uses to improve employee well-being? Sure, great question. Uh, we do not have internal psychologists, but we do have resources uh, on our HR page. We have a what we call a FastNet, which is our intranet for all communications internally. But we have resources for, for mental health as well as the third parties that, that we have access to that resource. And we also have uh, groups from um, you know keeping healthy from a physical standpoint too, and all that can tie into mental health as well. But those resources are available uh, internally uh, through a third party, and we certainly encourage that. And, and, and I will say this, I feel like our company is a, is a team. And so we work in small groups. So your general manager, your district sales manager, and then your employees that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis, we're small teams. And uh, a lot of that is a lot of communication, just one-on-one, -on -one, right? And so we, we can be um, a shoulder to, to, to cry on, per se, sometimes, if, if you need that, that support. And, and we do, uh, you spend a lot of time at work. You might as well uh, like what you do, and you might as well like the people you work with. And it, it does become a, a team and a family. You know, that family uh, is very supportive. And so it's not just um, you know, blood relative, but it, it's, it's the blue team, you know, pardon the pun, but, but that team uh, is family and that can be supportive 
and, uh, and a, a, a large part to the question that you just had as well. Awesome, thank you, Mike. Um, does anyone have any other questions before we finish this up? All right, looks like everyone got their questions out. So Mike, I will send your email and our follow-up email to all the students who attended today. That way, if they have questions later on, they can contact you. Um, we'll also post this video onto our Facebook page. That way, students can all access this information later on. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we finish up? Sure. Last thing I'll just say is that if you're interested in a career opportunity, you know, reach out to us. We can uh, direct you to the job application process where you can apply and upload your resume. But also say if, if it's not something that you're interested in from a specific industry or job description standpoint, I'm sure you know somebody that it is. It may pique their interest. And so I'm, I'm asking for a connection or an outreach to, to network. Uh, the more we can do that, uh, the better we'll all be. Uh, you might be able to find a career opportunity for someone that's looking for it, as well as we can find a, a great candidate. And, and that's part of why, you know, there's an ulterior motive to doing this. I want to provide value to you, the university, and the students, but I also want to find a pipeline for great people. And so the more we can spread the word and, and ask for referrals, uh, the better we'll all be. So just think about uh, what I talked about, if it, if it resonates with you, that you, you like that sense of ownership and running your own business and the autonomy, um, it's a great company. Uh, obviously, I wouldn't have been here 25 years if I didn't feel confident in that. Um, but I think that's a good testament in itself. So I just ask for the referral. Definitely. Thank you, John. Anything else you wanted to say before we log off? Uh, Mike, just thank you very much. Again, congratulations on 25 years. Hopefully there's a, uh, a big cake for you in the future. And uh, we look forward to working with you again, uh, you know, as things uh, normalize here over the next uh, couple of months. So thank you. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.